Okay. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for attending uh, tonight's meeting about the Pine Street Athletic Fields. My name is Sean Daly. I am the chairman of the Park and Rec Committee for the town of Manchester. Um, just to give you a little background of how, how we got here before I turn it over to the gentleman on my left, Cass. Um, back in the fall of 2017, the town of Manchester conducted a, a master plan survey, and one of the questions on there was about the Pine Street uh, land and what to do with it. Um, and the number one response on that was feedback we got from the participants that took the survey was uh, to use what the use should be would be to use the land for athletic fields. Um, and on top of that, the Park and Rec Committee, along with other committees uh, in town here, did their own master plan. So after the uh, Park and Rec did their master plan, it was identified um, that there is a lack of field or adequate fields in town. So between the survey and that and the master plan, uh, the select board then asked us in the, uh, in the fall of 2020 to put together a plan for the use of uh, the Pine Street or the old burn dump. Uh, and from there, that's where uh, we came up with the idea with an athletic field. Um, so from there, uh, we brought in, uh, to my left, Cass Carlos uh, from Weston and Samson, a landscape architect, to start going over that uh, property and looking at what could be done and what, what needs to be done in order to make that a athletic, athletic field. Um, so with that, I'll turn it over to Cass as far as walking a few comments that said yeah, right. they can't hear us. Yeah. Okay. Let me make sure people can hear. Check people. Yeah, how can we test to see if they're where? Audio? Yeah, they're checking right now. Okay, thank you. Thank you, everybody, for coming. We are checking on that audio right now. And that's why I have to keep my. Yeah, the speaker. People on the phone, can someone in the chat, can you hear us? Thumbs up. Dustin, can you hear us well enough? You, you see the screen? Yes? Okay. All right. Thank you. Great. You can't hear him now, though. I think we have everybody. Yeah. Okay. All right. So, should I kick that back off? Yeah. Yeah. Thumbs up, right? Do you want to go back to the beginning, or how far did we get? Yeah. We didn't, sorry to say, we didn't okay. do that. Okay, all right, good. Okay. <laughs> 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 okay. All right, okay, once again, good evening. Welcome, everybody, to the public meeting on the Pine Street Athletic Fields. My name is Sean Daly. I am the chair of the Park and Rec Committee. Um, to give you a little background on how we got to this, um, back in the fall of 2017, the town was creating a master plan and had a master plan survey. And one of the questions on that master plan survey was about the Pine Street uh, location or property. Um, and on that survey, the number one response of what the use for that property should be was recreation athletic fields. Um, so from there, the Park and Rec also did their own master plan. And after doing analysis of the current fields in town, uh, it was determined on that uh, plan that the fields we have are inadequate for the capacity of, of the sports and activities we have. Uh, and after that information, uh, the select board then looked at both the master plan survey and then the park and rec master plan and asked the park and rec committee to put together a plan uh, for the Pine Street property. Uh, from there, uh, 
Park and Rec reached out to Weston and Sampson, and to my left is Cass Kraus, the landscape architect, um, and he was the lead on assessing that land and determining what type of use, what size we could build, and so forth on that. Um, so I'm going to turn over to Cass to go through some slides and go through the information and review of that information. All right, thanks, Sean. Uh, hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. I uh, really appreciate you coming out and giving your time uh, to join us and discuss this project. Um, coming in here, just a couple quick items here. I just want to say that um, raise your hand if you're having any questions along the way, particularly those out in the ether and the Internet. Um, and just know that we're going to pause periodically a couple times to um, ask questions for those here in the room, but also those um, joining us via Zoom. Uh, and of course, we'll also have a Q&A at the end. So just uh, we want to make sure that we uh, listen to everybody and everybody gets a chance to, to ask any questions or, or make any statements. Uh, just to orient everybody and locate, uh, the green icon here is the location of Pine Street. So it's in the northwest part of town. Um, it's currently, it's on Pine Street. It comprises uh, the lots 156, 158, and 160, I believe. And just kind of reiterating what Sean said, just a, a brief note here about how we got here. Um, this is just a couple of uh, snippets from uh, the Town Recreation Fields Master Plan that we completed in, in 2020, um, where we talked about with different, um, a robust public outreach engagement and also site analysis um, investigations on different opportunities and different uh, and different things that are in assessing kind of where things stand. And so at the end, basically the select board said, all right, let's move forward uh, with Pine Street like they've been doing for a little while now. And so just to give some background on what that means here is that we did some, we did some data analysis and some, and some number crunching uh, back around the 2019 uh, timeframe. And what we found out was that a lot of the natural grass fields here are being overused. So you can see the far numbers here in the far right, Masconomo is being used 837 hours uh, Sweeney's being used a ton. I mean, you add up the baseball and, and, and uh, rectangular field sports, um, and you're well over 1,500 just for that one. I know that the baseball and softball is a little lighter use, of course, it's acknowledged, but still, um, the general standard industry standard for the amount of time uh, hours used on a field is between 450 to 550 for natural grass, just to uh, maintain growth, and, and, and it's a living medium, so it, it needs to have those breaks and rest, and it can't be overused. Otherwise, you get things like um, compaction, and wear and tear, and then just the field uh, conditions start to degrade. So just to also give a, a little heads up and a little nod here in terms of, in terms of a scale comparison, just to orient folks to kind of what size we're talking about here. So um, the, what we're comparing here is Pine Street on the left and Masconomo Park on the right. Uh, Pine Street, and this is assessing the playable space of these two, of these two uh, properties. Uh, for Pine Street, it would be 0.61 acres, and then at Masconomo Park, including all that area, including the baseball area, is 0.95 acres. And so I want to kind of say that the, the intention here for Pine Street is to accommodate a similar type of player. We're not looking to for high school lacrosse to be out there doing like a full game or anything. It's meant for some of the more youth sports um, and because that kind of offsets some of that heavy use that uh, Masconomo is seeing and Sweeney's, use, or Sweeney's seeing um, on an annual basis. And then just uh, some site history here. Um, I have to admit it was pretty pretty amazing to see going through my going through the timeline on Google Earth that back in 2008 there were um, residential homes here and then uh, that's on the far left in 2008 and then by 2014 you can start to see uh, that dirty dirt patch here which is actually the uh, site remediation work that's ongoing and occurring there um, and then here in 2022 here's a local local shot of, of a local time shot uh, showing how she's starting to get some scrub growth uh, on that cap layer. Um, so that cap layer, speaking to this, um, they did remediate the site, and as part of that, they identified the extents of the burn dump and also um, established through MassDEP a remediation plan, which included a soil cap cover, um, and that cover essentially is 12 inches with a geotextile fabric beneath that. And so when the MassDEP um, performed that remediation, or helped guide that remediation, essentially what they did is they put um, an AUL on the site, which is an activity and use limitation. And so these parcels all have this AUL, um, and an AUL uh, specifically is a legal document issued by DEP that identifies site conditions um, to maintain a condition of no significant risk um, after uh, a site has been cleaned up for contamination. Um, and the activities, and they can set whatever those uh, uses and limits are. And so for these specific parcels, um, down below we say that they are allowed to do, the scientists are allowed to, to have recreation athletic purposes, uh, routine landscaping within 12 inches, 
Um, that's just general ground maintenance. And then they could be converted to commercial or industrial use. Um, and then emergency repair and maintenance of utilities. And so as part of the, the, the project that we're looking to do here is uh, we're looking not to dig into the, um, dig past the 12 inch soil cap or the geotextile fabric. Uh, we're wanting to build up from there. And the reason being is that once you start to dig into that, below that geotextile fabric, you're getting into contaminated soil, um, which has to be um, transported and disposed in a, in a, a very legal and expensive manner. Um, to, to certain sites depending on what the contaminants are. And so in order to kind of save costs there, that's what we're trying to, we're basically building up as opposed to kind of digging down and flattening it out. So um, we're working with the cap um, to topography that they created there um, as part of the design. Um, just a couple of quick shots showing existing conditions. Um, so just kind of like volunteer species and grass here. Um, you got some Phragmites on the left below this, uh, below this riprap edge here. Um, I'll just, so this is one, this was that, so I'm getting through all the existing condition portions, so I'll just take a pause here for any questions. Uh, in the room, I'll start there first, just because there's only a couple select folks, if you want to have anything. Still good? Okay. Anybody out in the interwebs would like to Let's ask see. any questions? Throw it up in the chat, raise your hand, if we know how to do that. I did not see any raised hands. Just give it a, just a second longer just to make sure we can be patient. I'm not see raised hands. All right. I'll take that as a, we'll move on. Um, throw in the chat if there's something if you need to um, uh, want to go back. We didn't see you uh, trying to ask a question. So here's the proposed site plan. Um, you can see this dark green area space is the field playable space, which is 180 by 125 feet. Um, you can see that the kind of there's some white guy contour lines on the edges for those that don't know. Basically, it's just a grading plan that shows that we're building up the sides to, to meet the top uh, since we have to stay within that 12 inch depth for the soil cap. Um, and we're trying to maximize the parking spaces here while maximizing the playable space. So we have 25 parking spaces, which includes one handicap space by code. Um, and this, the, the field will be surrounded by a four-foot uh, four foot height black vinyl chain link fence um, with a mow curb for maintenance purposes. And then the slopes will be planted with um, a conservation mix and, and really with a, a hyper-focus on pollinator species and pollinator garden plants uh, for, from an ecological standpoint uh, to help that biodiversity. Um, you can see here basically Pine Street running along uh, from east to west. And it does, the entry drive does to climb steep grade there for just a, a, a few feet, like 25, 30 feet to get to the parking space area up to grade. Um, and those were all, the, these grades are also all driven by um, hoping to get enough depth for uh, curbs and such for the parking lot as well. It is currently proposed as asphalt, but we're working through that. Um, for this, this is a, a little more technical drawing. So this is more diagrammatic to show you um, in plan, but also in section, how those, uh, if you look in the edges here, you can start to see how that starts to die down, and that's the grade that we're proposing in terms of building up. Um, this dashed line shows you the existing condition and the existing grade of where we're trying to uh, build up from. And then also it shows the different types of things in terms of the natural turf field, which is the playable field, versus um, this lighter green area is also kind of like a preparatory space. Um, think of like kids waiting, parents waiting for the next game to start, or like that, so they can just uh, warm up a little bit of things like that. Um, and then getting into the cost estimate, um, this is just a simplified version of this. We've gone into the kind of nuts and bolts with, with uh, the committee here. Uh, but essentially site preparation is 250, which includes that um, basically some of that earthwork and things like that. Um, rectangular natural turf field and planting that basically gets to the uh, the field itself space, the, the uh, interstitial spaces that'll be uh, conservation mix, and then the parking lot as well. Um, so at an all-in cost with a 15% contingency at this point, uh, which I still recommend holding for now, just given costs uh, and the direction they're going, but also just because we're dealing with a contaminated site um, that's been remediated by the, uh, through MassDEP. Um, and we do want to just say that there is an allowance here that shows below for 10% for inflation, just to note to folks that uh, we are seeing escalating costs uh, on an ongoing basis, which we're seeing everywhere, uh, including the grocery store. So uh, just something to keep note of. Um, but
but it is we are starting to see stabilization. I will say that uh, for most items, there are some items that are not. Um, and then just from a general timeline and, and uh, project schedule standpoint, um, we had the kickoff back in the, of this specific project in December of 2021. Uh, we hustled out there and got the um, environmental delineation out there. Um, in January, we're still working with the Conservation Commission. We had some uh, preliminary meeting with Chris Bertoni, who's the conservation agent, uh, just to kind of introduce the project to her and get her recommendations and guidance on how to best approach it from her standpoint and the uh, Conservation Commission standpoint. Um, and really, so she's going to have to go out there and verify those flags that we put out there. Uh, we have that scheduled. I think we're trying to get that done for next week. And then um, design development, we're ongoing it. We're refining and tightening everything up right now. And then by that point, we hope to get out to bid um, late fall of summer, just because we have to go through the NOI process um, due to its proximity to um, um, environmental resources. And then the goal is that we could commence construction in the fall 2022. So starting this year, and depending on the type of, uh, of grass and surface we choose, there could either be a, a two season growing period if it's a loma seed or hydro seed. And it can only be one growing season if you do um, a sod grass as well. So um, given the size of the field here, uh, a, sod, a sod size field would be recommended just because um, for the amount of cost versus the exp expediency of getting onto the field and playing right away, is, it's worthwhile, I think. But that's for you all to decide. And then again, any questions from the room? Okay. Any questions from Zoom? I do not see any. Um, I hope we're not missing anybody. Oh, can, well, Dustin's trying to say Dustin. something. You popped up there. Yeah. <laughs> Turf or grass? I think that means is it going to be is a natural is it going to be is it going to be growing grass or a synthetic turf grass? I, the, the answer is it'll be a growing grass, so natural grass. So it'll still be um, a, a different grass that's growing there than today. It's a good question. Justin, are you can you speak? You are unmuted. No. Does you want to pop it into the chat, maybe? Capable people. Yep. Is this still planned? The original. Had the spectator seating. Oh, the spectator seating has been pulled out from now, I think. Um, I think we're just trying to keep an eye on the cost at the moment. Um, that's an element that I think, given where we're at, that, you, that could be added at some point, but it would change the earthwork a bit to make room for that. Um, unless you want to put it in that kind of interstitial space that's that light green area. Um, call it this light green area here, if, my, if I'm still presenting my screen here. And then, uh, Colby has why not turf. He's talking about the grass field, he's asking why not turf. Uh, that's a good question. I think that, I think just given its proximity to some of the environmental resources and kind of a, a nod to that, and I think given um, a bit of where the, uh, of the, of the users of this, the youth uh, athletics that will be participating here, youth team sports, um, the one thing that we'll, we'll need to work out that's part of the details here is, and this is preliminary conversation, so pardon me, Nate, but we're talking about a water, a water connection so that it can have like just like a, a water cannon just to give it that uh, extra watering during the dry seasons, but um, hopefully we can get an, a, a, a seed mix that we will get a seed mix that it will be as drought tolerant as we could possibly make it. And then I don't know if you saw a cat. There was a follow-up question told me about the grass, about the drainage. You mentioned uh, an example of magnolia fields over magnolia there. Is there an issue with drainage uh, um, of the cap? That's a great question. We should not. So we're actually building up off the cap and we're doing a sheet flow. Um, the site is graded at one and a half percent, so it should have uh, sufficient movement, basically surficially and then um, subsurficially below. Um, but essentially, we're building that up so we have control of what that, what the, what the geosoils are there, um, and how that would flow through. A geosoils is probably not the right terminology there. Um, but yeah, so essentially, as we're sheep flowing off everywhere, we're not putting it to drain, so there, we, there should not be any. Um, since we're constructing it fresh, um, it should be perfectly graded. They laser grade typically everything nowadays and it's highly controllable. 
And then Cheryl, I think there was a question from Dustin. But, yeah, Dustin side. asked if Parks and Rec is still okay moving forward with the 180 by 125 versus the original 240 by 150. You may want to talk about that because we did talk about it. Yeah, I mean, obviously we we'd love a larger field, um, but we one we are okay with moving with this size of the field. Uh, we initially started with a larger size field, uh, but once Cass and his company uh, did the assessment of the field, it was determined that. Um, based on setbacks and buffer zones and so forth um, that we couldn't build the first size we wanted. So um, obviously we settled on the 180 by 125, which uh, to Cass's earlier point in the presentation, um, we really look at this field as uh, primarily for younger youth sports or you know just a half field for maybe some older, older youth sports to use as a practice. Yeah, that's right. So I just I just want to add is that so basically we we had to get it essentially um, redelineated from an environmental resources standpoint and get those surveyed so that we could see exactly what we're dealing with out here um, and the grades. And I think um, one item one thing that we're doing here is we could maximize the field a little bit extra by building some sort of type of wall or something like that. But I think we're trying to keep it um, as respectful of the space and, and cost conscious as possible. And so that's the approach with the sloped up sides and things like that. Yeah. So. Okay, we have a question from Bob Doyle. He said, we don't have a great track record of maintaining grass fields. What is the issue with no turf? That is, why not turf? I think it's from a cost standpoint. I think um, it's one of those things where um, I think just given that's how f we are going deep, we are going into the non to 30 foot, or sorry, into the 50 foot non, no build zone. Um, we're going up against the 30-foot no disturb zone, so we're, we're very close and we're maximizing the field as best we can in terms of our disturbance. Um, and so that's why we're just trying to be mindful of that um, as we go through the Conservation Commission process and the, you know, the notice of intent process that goes through MassDEP. Maybe, Nate, you want to speak just a little bit about the maintenance, how we are working on bringing up the maintenance plan of the fields. Yeah, so we'll be, that will be under DPW. Uh, we intend to bring in a water connection so we can, you know, water as necessary during the summer or spring um, to get the, the uh, field playable. Um, but that will roll under DPW as, you know, one of our standard uh, maintenance of all the other fields that we do um, between Sweeney, Masco, um, so I'll just go into the fold of, of our operations. Okay, then Colby said he strongly recommends turf. Um, really hurts our ability to get on the fields in the spring. Without irrigation, it'll be a concrete slab over time. I think maybe we kind of address that with the water cannons um, as for the not turning into the concrete slab. Um, and as for getting out in the spring, I know that's a big issue at Sweeney where it's really wet, um, but we don't anticipate um, where, like Cass was saying, um, we're going to have it laser graded. It shouldn't be as much of an issue. Mm -hmm. That's right. I think drainage. through the design process, we're making sure we have sufficient, basically the sufficient uh, slope so that it helps push that water or guide the water off to the surface. Um, but also we'll have a, a soil mix that also helps it infiltrate as much as possible to help get a nice, long, deep root uh, growth out of, this, out of this seed. Okay, he followed up with uh, sheath grade will rill, turf won't. That's foreign to me. I don't know what that means. Sheath grade R I L L. Sheath grade will real turf mm -hmm. won't. Not following. Right. Yeah, I'm not I'm just quite sure. Erosion. All right. Uh, Bob Doyle agrees with Colby. Um, so this, so the playing surface is only 1.5 percent, which is not uh, an extreme grade. The slopes off to the sides are three to one. Um, which is basically where you're maximizing the grade out, but it's still made it as, it's a kind of a maintenance standard slope. Um, plus that's going to be let, uh, let grown back where it's not needing that kind of maintenance. So we can add soil stabilization fabric that allows uh, that conservation mix in those pollinator gardens to establish and, and grow. And then you, those, those won't need any extra care beyond that. Okay, Bob followed up with um, the noise of grass cutting for neighbors. Um, but I know that would be done during regular DPW hours. Yes, yeah, that would be done during the day. I think pretty standard. It should not, you know, it's not very large, so we can, you know, with our mowers, we'll, it'd be pretty quick. So. Okay. Um, then Dustin um, said, speaking of maintenance, what kind of surface do we expect for parking? Would a permeable surface be preferable for long-term maintenance and drainage? So we're looking at asphalt right now is what we have included in our scope. 
Uh, we are reviewing a permeable surface, um, so when we go to CONCOM, we have another alternative, um, just in terms of stormwater handling. Um, but so we'll we'll explore both of those options and and see which one um, you know is more beneficial in the long run. Uh, and Colby said, what's the long-term cost of mowing over turf? Aren't people getting hotter to get? I'm believing it's probably referring to summer staff. He says it's probably harder to get the staff to do that. Yeah. Um, we, we actually have more summer hires this year than we ever have before, or at least in the four years I have been here. But, um, you know, I think there's also upfront cost with turf, um, you know, Beyond just the initial, you know, cost of the turf, we'd also have to do a deeper sub-base. Correct me if I'm wrong. That's correct. So we'd have to bring up the grade of the entire site in addition to, uh, you know, just the area that we're doing. So it's, you know, it's not just the cost of the turf. It's everything else that kind of goes along with, you know, doing that uh, turf. That's right, yeah. So to, to add a little uh, kind of technicality to that, too, is that, yeah, a synthetic turf typically has about a 16-inch sub-base there versus this, the, the grass needs about 8 inches of nice, good loam, and that's more, than, that's more than sufficient for that. But exactly, that depth there, and also where that water goes, you typically need lateral drains, and where those kind of would be outlet and things like that. Right. It's, a, it's, it's a much more robust system and much more expensive. Okay, Col Colby followed up with we should do a return on investment um, analysis, which we actually do have one in our original master plan the, of turf versus grass. That's right. Um, so I can get that to you, Colby. Here. And John, can you explain the implications of a, sorry, let's see. Can you explain the implications of a turf field opposed to grass relative to the wetland buffer? Would a turf field be approved in the buffer? What is the cost difference? I think that's one of the big challenges of, of synthetic turf going in there is that it is in the jurisdiction of the Conservation Commission. So um, they ultimately are looking at it from an ecological and um, mass DEP regulation standpoint. And so um, they have to approve it. And that's what that NOI, the Notice of Intent process, is for. Um, and so that's what we're trying to say, that the natural grass has the benefit of, uh, of basically going through Conservation Commission, but also from a cost impact standpoint. Colby gave you a thumbs up. <laughs> all right. Thanks, Colby. That looks like all of them in the chat right now. Anyone in the room want to add? Did you have a question? Yeah. Basically, done with the whole Absolutely, please. We're, we'd love questions. Oh, okay. Absolutely, we're great. Yep. Right. So I live in the neighborhood at 155 Pine Street. Okay. So I guess my main concern up over here tonight. Well, that's Harrington Way right across. Yep. And then the Moses Hill turnout uh, just um, to the south is I live right in the corner. Okay. So um, my concern would be potential adverse impacts to you know the local residents. That being uh, noise, um, visual impacts, which you partially already addressed, and then barking. Um, and um, after you address those, I just wanted to comment on the traffic issue because it's a concern that I should be aware of. So, um, as far as the noise, I was thinking perhaps trees or something along Pine Street margin to help dampen it. Um, and um, that would also mitigate um, visual impacts. And um, parking, I know you've got 28 spaces there, but um, I, I would guess that people are going to be parking alongside the street anyway. They won't be crossing over the street, which is my final, more or less, of a comment. Living on Pine Street, the, the speeding is terrible. Okay, they posted it at 25, but Frankly, some people are going as much as slice, slice that property. And um, I'd be very concerned because it's on the bend there that there'll, there'll be children that are going to be um, walking to the site. So, you know, how have you cranked all of this into your design? I know you're in the early design stage, so. I think that's where, so I think for us, we're, we're trying to maximize the amount of parking spaces as we can on site, um, and also trying to maximize the playable space. and. Um, we do acknowledge that 25 is like, if we could have more, we certainly would fit more on there. I think that's 
something we're trying to work through with Nate and, and the town in terms of how, what happens if and when. Yeah, I don't have a feel for these fields, how many people show up and, you know, it's been an issue at other times. I think we could do like, I think we could do a zoom out and kind of start, just look at it from like basically a Pine Street local standpoint um, and kind of start to think about what are the visual kind of sight lines and how that works with, it's Pine Street a State Road, you know? Uh, not until it gets to 128. No. Okay, just because sometimes the state road, what that has, they have different requirements. Um, no, it's not as big. No, mass, not. yeah, MassDOT has different yeah. requirements of sight distance things for things like that for crossings and things. Um, yes. So we can kind of investigate that to kind of see how that fits within kind of those standards. Okay. Question for you, Nate: Can yep. we do? We're going to have to do a crosswalk. We are, yeah. So we uh, are going to speed bumps. <laughs> that joke. Yeah, I don't know if we could do speed bumps. Um, I mean, it's something we could explore, um, but we are gonna we are gonna look uh, reach out to the bike and ped committee. Uh, we do have the sidewalk go that is up the outbound side. Um, so within under DPW, it probably won't be in under this project, uh, but you know, kind of in concert with DPW, we'll likely do a sidewalk there. Work with the bike and ped committee to see what kind of mitigation measures you know, are appropriate for this location um, to make, you know, crossing Pine Street there safe for kids, because um, that's, up, you know, obviously utmost concern. Um, regarding parking, um, we do have a decent shoulder on the inbound side uh, along the fields. So I think we do want to see, you know, kind of how it goes. And then we have that shoulder that we could uh, probably accommodate additional parking uh, off the side um, and then do additional signage to help, you know, with the speed there. And I'm glad you brought that up because we did, um, we were kind of saving it till the end, but a couple of the neighbors had sent us emails and mm -hmm. they were concerned about the same as you mentioned, Olga, um, a crosswalk and, you know, mm -hmm. safety, obviously. Sure. We're all concerned. Um, so that will definitely, it's not part of this, but it'll be part of before we actually mm -hmm. open it to make sure it is safe for people to get there. I don't really don't want flashing lights, but you might consider flashing lights on the inbound side. Oh. That's, a, that's where the curves steepest, and they really come around that wind fast. Yeah. So yeah. a constant um, blinking no, or a I, crossing I like blinking? Not on a constant, but when, when the field's in use type of thing. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I was thinking when somebody hits it to cross, more like one of those, like one of the crossing yeah, signals. That, yeah. Whatever, I'm yeah. not, that's okay. yeah. not my expertise, but yeah, I, I think it's an important consideration. Okay. Thank you. Yes. So we had a Florence that was trying to ask a question. Uh, oh, sorry. Dustin said radar speed sign is likely the most effective. Thank you, Dustin. Um, so sorry, I lost someone named Florence. Beth, did we have any luck with being able to unmute people? Do we have any luck with being able to unmute? Um, no. Okay. All right. Last one. I'll look up. Florence. Oh, this is Florence. Uh, Florence says it's essential Correct, to have... Correct, Dustin. Sorry. Huh? Yeah, right. yeah, we can't, we can't we hear, can't hear anybody. Yeah. yeah, unfortunately. Sorry, you guys see. I don't know, but feedback. the TV's not, it doesn't have the audio joined. So I don't know if we're, if this is just a visual for us or if this is, or for I assume we're through the cameras. I thought it was supposed to pipe through those speakers. Yeah. Um, Colby is really worried with this being a practice only field. The wear and tear is going to be very concentrated. Um, that's going to be. Thought, I think tough with real grass, also four foot fence are going to be silly. Ball easily go over that. Our goal is going to be kept on site. Uh, all goals are purchased by the youth leagues, um, not by the town. So whatever goals that would be there would be whatever the youth leagues decide they need there. So I would assume it would be the small sided nets to kind of go through with the use. Um, and it would be up to the leagues if they want to store it there and how they want to store it. Um, yeah, and I think a uh, comment to the wear and tear, I think. Um, thank you. When it's mostly more towards the youth, it's not as impactful as, like, say, like high school, particularly like football and things like that, 
or places where it's uh, extremely concentrated. I think this being a multi-use field and the fact that I've, I, I, I have, I very much suspect that they'll turn that sideways and start running uh, like youth little games and practice uh, sequences kind of side by side. I'm right. um, just kind of like to do a Masco. I know that just because I'm, I'm an Essex resident, so my girls are in the other room over there. I'm surprised they haven't popped their head in, um, which is great. And then, so it's just one of those things, I think they'll just use it a lot like that in terms of how that goes. So I, th yeah. I, don't, I don't think it'll be extremely with the, the, the super heavy duty wear and tear. Right, so there wouldn't be any permanent nets there, which I think would help the wear and tear because then it would be more like practices with stations and moving it around as opposed to when there are permanent nets, then that goal mouth ends up being the spot that's used the most as we see at um, even the turf fields. Yeah. Um, but I really want to get to Florence. Um, to Cheryl, let's just add one thing to that. Yep, was, sorry. Uh, you know, I, I understand the grass, yes, wear and tear, but as far as one of the earlier slides that Cass had up, it's really there, too, to reduce the use of the other fields, to give the other fields a little more chance to recover when they're used. So to Cass's point, if you use That's this right. field more for um, younger use sports, less wear and tear on that, but it also then takes off use hours on the other fields, Masconomo and Sweeney Baseball and Sweeney Softball slash rectangular field there um, for the older youth to play on, but it gives it gives a little bit more time to recover when they do use it. So forth. That's right. And I just want to add one note if this slide is, is visible up here um, in terms of the hours that we were looking at. It is important to note that even with these, like, so Masconomo gets 837 hours a year versus the 550 max that's recommended, but that also doesn't include, um, that's basically just the permitted hours there. It's not actually um, any ad hoc type of recreation things that happen out there. Right, it's so. not like the concerts or exactly um, right. pickup games or any of that. Um, and Masconomo, of all of them, is kind of our, our backup field. So that's really when we can't use the other fields is when we use Masconomo because it is more of a passive park. Um, and even with that, it's still overused. That's right. Yep, and Sweeney's overused as well, so it can help offset some of those hours, particularly in the rectangular field space over next by the softball field. Okay, Florence, now we'll get to you. Sorry to keep you waiting. Oh. Hey. No, no, can you hear me? No, yeah, we can yeah, hear you. Hi. I'm not going to read okay. your chat. You can say it yourself. Right. Go oh, ahead. I'm going to, uh, I'm at 6 Anthony Avenue, so we are a brothers to uh, the field. And uh, I, I just want to go back to the question of access from Pine Street because I think that's been sort of a sideline a bit from the beginning. And to me, that's uh, an extremely essential question that needs to be very specifically answered. Uh, as it is, it's probably the most um, dangerous stretch of street in Manchester from our point of view, whether it be coming from 128 or from the town itself. And kids will be walking, kids will be riding their bikes, many of them won't be getting a ride. It needs to be absolutely addressed. To me, that's almost a non-starter. Looking at the field, that's lovely, and the parking spots and such, but unless there is guaranteed and specific safe access for everyone to that field, um, it's, you know, it's not a reasonable project in my view. So I'm not sure which department is responsible for that. Speed bumps, signs, a light, whatever it takes, that needs to be guaranteed up front, not after the fact. So that's, uh, that's a very strong point for me to stress. No, thanks. Thank Florence. you. Thanks, Florence. I appreciate the feedback there. Um, I just want to kind of say that we can work through some of those items as we uh, kind of progress this design through. We can start yeah. to add that commentary and kind of um, help make sure that those things are being thought about and discussed um, as this moves forward. Yeah, so within, you know, DBW, we'll be going to working with the Bike and Ped Committee, as I said earlier, um, to really start exploring that. We wouldn't open the field without implementing um, that crosswalk, all the safety measures. So we'll be reaching out to the bike and ped committee, um, you know, in the next month or so um, to get that process rolling and of what they want to do, um, you know, and get their ideas of how we can make this, you know, area and access as safe as possible. In Florence, even though we said after the um, project, it's not after the project really. It's just that this project we're concentrating on the field, but we're not going to open it without making sure that it's safe. Does anyone else want to try talking now? 
Great. <laughs> Thank you. Colby, give it a shot. Testing. Hey, Testing. Yep. There you go. Right. I can hear you. Perfect. First off, really, really thank you guys. I'm not trying to be um, negative at all about it. It's it's awesome. Anytime we, we desperately need all the field space we can get. And thank you for being creative with this. Um, I just have spent a lot of time on Magnolia Woods. And I really want to make sure that we do everything differently than they did. <laughs> um, because when that erosion does start happening, it ends up causing holes that go right down to the cap and I don't know why those holes happened and you know that's your part to figure out but I, I, I do know that they did happen all over the place and it really became you know it's become very problematic so that we we had to stop using that field a couple of years ago. Um, I do have questions about lights. Um, I know you had a, a question in there or a time about usable things and as we all know like you know, this time of year is great. We get the most time out of things, but in the fall, the daylight gets quick, fast, and I know lights are always controversial. So has that, or at least planning for that, if it's not in phase one, been thought about? Um, it thought about, yes. Um, is it happening? The answer is no. Part of it is because of the neighborhood, but the other part, even more importantly, is that we can't dig down to put lights in. Sorry, Cass, do you want to speak a little more to that? No, I think that's great. Exactly right. I think um, I think where it's resources. Daddy, leave it down for the back of it. Uh, oh yeah. I got that. Oh. You forgot something. <laughs> Um, yeah, I think that's a great point. So basically, um, there is a camp. We have that figured out down there in terms of where it would be. Um, the question is, it's like where that basically you don't want to go into that capped area um, just because then you would basically, once you do that and you expose that contaminated soil, it opens up the whole process to the mass DEP, which um, turns yep. into like a three or four year process going through that just to, from a permitting standpoint. Thanks, Dave. <laughs> no problem. Okay, so that's not a, that's not an option. Do you need to have that for the parking area? Um, I don't think. I mean, that's just a. It's kind of a. I'd yeah, say it's a want. It isn't a need. It's just a parking space area. Um, do, do, what else do we have to have? What lights for the parking? Lights for no, the parking. there's no yeah. lights at Singing Beach parking lot, Masconomo parking lot, yeah. Sweeney. There's no lights cool. at Sweeney parking yeah. lot. No. And cool. And then the last one was just around the fences. I, I know it is meant for youth sports. Um, I, I'm lucky enough to have gone through with a, I have two that are finishing up youth sports and two more that are starting. It's amazing how much my T-ballers like love to, or my coaches pitch teams love to grand slam it even at five and six years old. So um, I, you know, I, I, I do care about the, the conservation areas there. So I guess, why are we doing a four foot fence that, you know, just coming off of coaches field right now, I think maybe uh, I saw about 20 kids chasing lacrosse balls, you know, into the conservation areas um, with it. So can we make those higher so the balls tend to stay in better? Uh, yeah, I think we could totally look into that, I think. Um, I think there will just have to be some, in certain areas, there will have to be some consideration as to how it's uh, constructed just due to the cap. But there's ways to work around that. I think we're fine and, and the method that we're going to do there. Um, so we could investigate um, a yeah. higher fence and just kind of what that people feel like they want and what's going on there would be a little bit of a cost increase, but um, chain link fence is one of the more expensive things out there today anyways yeah. and hard to get. And I think that's something we can carry as an ad alternate when we bid the project, just giving us another option um, in terms of how we can ultimately award the project. And I know, Colby, a lot of times for lacrosse, what happens is there has to be kind of a um, an addition, almost like they have it Sweeney, not that it's in great shape right now, but um, behind the, the goals or, or something, you have to put in kind of a, a net on top of the fence. So, right. you know, that could be looked at as an ad alternate too. That's right. And I think yeah, does that, does that work with the cap? I mean, you bring up a good point. What do you have to do? Do you have to put like a concrete ID beam or something underneath and then that becomes the stability for the post? Um, so it's, it would be a combination, uh, at least the way I'm thinking of it right now, is that I think um, this fence area here is where there'll be some issues because of the grades that were going down. But once you start to come around here, we're raising it like four, five, six feet just on the sides here, four or five feet. So plenty of room for a standard kind of footing down past frost depth. 
Um, so that wouldn't be an issue in terms of the cap. And even if we are doing it in the cap, um, I am working with um, our environmental engineers on this as well. They're very much uh, involved in it with the LSPs and whatnot. And they, basically what we can do is we can pile drive those poles in so we don't have to actually excavate and create any spoils, dirt spoils that would have to be disposed of. So that would uh, basically save it from having to go through that uh, mass DEP process. Yeah, okay, cool. And then I'm sorry, the, the, the last one is just going back to the, the turf for it. I, I can see all the logic that you're pointing on grass, but I think the point that holds me up there is not irrigating it. Um, and, you know, I'm just going to even point to town hall right now. We spent, and it does look really nice out front there, um, but it's just really nice for our DP, uh, DPW crew to be able to set it and forget it with the, with the irrigation. And, you know, it really does lead to, I think it, you know, it leads to a much better feel over time just because we can control the water going onto it. That's something, would, that, that's something I think we can just, given that it's been brought up a few times, I think it's something that we can continue yeah. to investigate. We can kind of look at kind of the, the profile and sectional detail of how that would work and if it can work with the, with the depth and the profile that we need versus the, the irrigation piping. Um, and then... Again, that could also be something that's in that alternate that yeah. could be Agreed. considered in that point. And and with the turf, you brought up the point about the 16, but there's really no height issue with the, the turf with coming up on the uh, cap, right? It's only, it, it, the, it's more about the thinness, like going up 16 versus, yes, it'll add some incremental cost, but you, you can go up three feet if you want. Correct? Yes, but so when you, every, for it, as you raise it up, what it does is you have to basically eat that grade on the side so it basically shrinks the field is what's happening because yeah. as you go up you have to create that slope to get there yeah right JB. I, I got your point there is no irrigation I, I wish there was i think it would stay a lot better shape there okay to answer that question okay thank you all again very very sure. supportive i you know hopefully we can find more of these Yeah, I will add that just as this kind of Colby brought that up just at the very end there is that uh, during that master planning process, we did investigate all potential sites that we could potentially find. And there's just not a lot of um, not a lot of available real estate to, to put in a, a field of any mag magnitude. Um, so really, it's just trying to take advantage of what the city has and, and can put forward here. We're working on that. I have positive news coming your way sometime soon. Excellent. We look forward to it. Um, any other questions from the gallery? Either in the chat or with a hand. I feel like we should hear Dustin say something since he wanted to speak. He could. <laughs> I did send forth a very lengthy email ahead of time, so I had most of my questions answered. <laughs> <laughs> All right, there it is. Thank you. Yes, I felt like um, since you were trying to talk earlier, we should give you your chance. Yeah. <laughs> Appreciate that. Thank you. Anybody in the room? You guys feel good? There was one comment in the chat, but it was really from person to person, so we're good there. I would say, that just to kind of wrap it up here again, I will say that I think that um, as we kind of refine this and go through the, the Conservation Commission process um, and the outcomes of that, I think uh, we can basically have another meeting to kind of bring that in front of everybody again, just to kind of sh show everybody where things are falling and landing, and then um, have another conversation about it to make yeah. sure we're um, pushing it forward in the right direction for everybody. And I think as, as we get closer to bidding this project, we can help, uh, we can further refine costs, you know, with kind of inflation the way it's been, it's been very hard to estimate projects and have a, you know, a, a good feeling about where you have, uh, you know, uh, your money at. So as we get closer, I think we can start to take a harder look at some of these, you know, quote unquote extra items, you know, if we can do irrigation um, and a, a taller fence, you know, we'll certainly look at those and uh, include them in the bid if we can or if we feel you know it's uh, you know likely to uh, come back within our budget 
-hmm. Yeah, so we're thinking we'll probably do um, another public meeting um, probably towards the end of July, middle of August, in that, that range. And I know, um, well, I say that it'll probably end up, end up more like the end of August, which might be better with people traveling and whatnot. So okay. um, definitely when we're, you know, closer to 75 to 90 percent along, I think um, we'll do another public meeting. And even if it's just a follow-up, um, it'll be a good opportunity to people to speak again. Um, anything yeah. else? What do you think? I think it'd be after the NOI process so we can kind of get their feedback and kind of see what kind of orders and conditions they would have um, and how we'd need to evolve the design from their perspective. Sounds reasonable. Anyone else? Well, thank you everybody for coming. Thank you in the room and thank you for coming on Zoom. This was our first try at doing the live and in Zoom. So thank you for your patience, especially. Um, it's quite the setup we have here, and I do think that other committees will be following suit um, in the near future. Um, if anybody didn't get to speak or didn't, didn't, um, didn't know how to use the chat or didn't get to speak, then um, send an email to either myself, I'm Cheryl Marshall, the Park and Recreation Director, or to Nate DeRosier and DPW. Instead of going through our emails, you can get them um, right off the town website. Um, and again, thank you everybody for coming, and thank you for your patience. That's good. Great. Yep. All right. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank Thanks, you. everyone. Appreciate your time. Thank you all. Thank you so much.